So now we get on to Revelation. I think it's a bit of a challenge, really, to sort of look at the whole structure of Revelation in, in one talk. But uh, things I uh, sat down with Brother Pete and looked at how we would divide up these sessions. I can't really blame anyone but myself um, for that. But uh, what are we going to do? Well, we're just going to look at which inter- interpretation, uh, which uh, we're just going to look at very, br- very briefly. <coughs> But then we're going to look at what I call continuous historic predictions. Uh, what, what did the brethren and sisters many years ago say that Revelation represented before the times when it was supposed to be fulfilled uh, and see, see whether what they said came true or not? Because that's a good test, isn't it? It's the scriptural test of whether an interpretation is correct. And then we're going to look at the, the structure together drawing out uh, for each of the elements what writers in the past have written about their understanding of them. So, which interpretation? Well, of course, you know, we're following the continuous historic interpretation here. Why? Because it builds on Daniel. It's harmonious with what Daniel says. It's using that, that same framework to give us the key that we need to unlock the complexities of Revelation. (coughs) If we look at Revelation and say, well, this is a further interpretation of Daniel's fourth beast, because there are so many images that come across, then we know where to look. We know from Daniel's image that that the grand scheme of things, we know where we're supposed to start and where we're supposed to end. And knowing that, we can then piece together the pieces of the jigsaw. If anything, the the book of (coughs) Daniel is the outline on the front of the jigsaw box. It tells us what we're supposed to be putting together. They're in lots of pieces in in Revelation. And we've got to look at them and say, "Well, well, how does that fit in? But we've got the master plan already. The other thing with the continuous historic interpretation is it's the only one that passes what I call the Amos test. You see, if you look at other interpretations, that interpretations have put everything a long time in the past or a long time in the future at some indeterminate time, God has left his people without knowledge. They've got a framework in Daniel and that's it. And they haven't got a clue where they are on God's master plan. (coughs) But the continuous historian has given brethren and sisters through the centuries an understanding of where they are and how they fit into God's plan. And we don't have miracles, do we, brethren and sisters? We don't have the Lord Jesus saying, well, (coughs) I can turn water into wine or I can heal this person. That's why you should believe me. But we have the miracle of prophecy. And through the ages, brethren and sisters have been able to say, I think that means that. And then it's come to pass. And so they have had reinforced their faith by the things that have event, events that have happened. So you look back in history and you see how many times people write about the signs of the times. They're always doing it. Because they can always see something being fulfilled in their time, in their lifetime that is further in God's plan and purpose and is moving them closer and closer to the day when the Lord Jesus returns. But there's a straitjacket with continuous historic and that is our interpretation can't change radically because if we suddenly decide well actually do you know what this all means and come up with something completely different then what we're effectively saying is all those brethren and sisters through all the last 1,000, 1,500, 1,800 years, they're all wrong. None of them understood it. They were all adrift. So we have a straitjacket. We have to interpret in the same way that brethren in the 1st or 2nd or 3rd or 4th century were understanding. And of course that doesn't sit too well, does it, with our generation? We're the, ooh, shiny, shiny generation. We always want the the new gadget, the latest (coughs) thing. Have you heard the latest idea about this or that? 
Well, it's continuous historic is more of the same, more of the same. And perhaps that's why, in these last ages, we've had so many challenges to continuous historic. Because people always want something new. But time and again, we vindicate the continuous historic. I've only been listening to talks for 30 years, and I can remember brethren and sisters, well, no, not brethren and sisters, brethren, we can remember, brethren, telling brethren and sisters about what the continuous historic predicted. As I was a teenager and I was looking at the Berlin Wall coming down and, and things like that. And year by year, I have seen the things that they said would happen that at the time looked faintly ridiculous when you looked at the signs of the times of what was happening in Europe. And I've seen them step by step coming through. And so in my lifetime, and those of you that are older than me in your lifetime, will have seen so much of what our forefathers looked for coming through that we are truly blessed in these matters. Let's just see how consistent interpretation is through the ages. Now we're looking here at the seals. We're going to, when we look at the structure, we'll look at the seals again, but I just want to pull this out and just show you some pertinent facts about interpretation through the ages. We're looking at there the first and the fourth seals and the sixth seals. It shows us something quite interesting. So our first commentator that we can find is Tertullian, who speaks or writes about 190 AD. He identifies the first seal as the gospel in the first century. The second seal he identifies as war. He doesn't give an opinion on the third seal. That's quite a way into the future from, from him. And the fourth seal he, he sees as death. Sixth seal, he, he doesn't give an opinion on. Okay, a little bit later, now we've got a subtle change. Death has become plague, but if you've got the plague and die, well, the, dis- the distance is, is not too great. He's now identified in seal three, famine. When we come to Andreas, we then start having some precision about the interpretation. It's the gospel in the first century. It's the war era in the 2nd century. 3rd century of famine, 4th century of plague. So they're getting very precise as to, as to what they say. And, and it's not that far away from, from when they are. So they are able to look back in recent history to them. But seal 6, they're not quite sure about it. They, they, call, they say it's Antichrist, and we know from the scriptures that Antichrist is, is that which is against the gospel. It's a corruption of the truth. So, so they're seeing in seal six something that's corrupting the truth. But, but they, they, they give it quite a general term. Come down with me to Purvi and four others in 1390 to 1571. See now, there's a slight change of en- emphasis. Now, because they're a long way away from those events that were happening in the, the second, third, and fourth centuries, they, they, they lump it together and they, they say, well, yes, it's war, famine, and plague, but it's in the second and third century. Do you see what's happened? They're a long way, they're now looking into the almost ancient history. So, so the interpretation's consistent, but they've got a slightly different slant on it because it's such a long time ago. And when we come to Fulk in 1573, we notice that he's the first one that we we can find that doesn't say it's Antichrist, but but he gives a a slightly different uh, interpretation of what the sixth seal is. Again, it it is an Antichrist, but he's saying now that that the, the, the events of the sixth seal are to do with great alterations and changes in empire and religion. Now that's consistent with what we would traditionally understand the sixth seal to be, to, to be, inter, uh, be interpreted as, and that's Constantine, because that's what Constantine did. He changed rulership and religion. So, so although Fluke isn't or Fulk isn't um, isn't actually identifying Constantine as a person, he, he's identifying what he does. And then we get to 1605, and it's quite interesting, it's only from 1605 onwards that that people identify directly with Constantine. 
History is interesting in, in two ways. When you are amongst, within the history, you, you can see firsthand what's going on. So our understanding of, of what's happening in Europe will be better than perhaps brethren 200 years ago, because we're first hand and we can see the, the, all the things that are happening. But sometimes being in the middle of something isn't actually the best place to be from a perspective point of view. For example, when we sat in September the 11th and watched the Twin Towers being demolished, every one of us knew that something major was happening. And, looking back now, how many years since, we can see that, that, that it had major effects. But if the Lord remain away, in 200 years' time, will 9-11 be so seismic as it does now? Only history would tell. So sometimes, with the telescope of history, you're able to look back and say, do you know what, that is the really seismic event of that time. And that's what it was with Constantine. The, the, the historians looked back and they saw what Constantine did and they said that really fits with that sixth seal. It's consistent with what Fulk says. It's a changing. But now they, they singled out a single person. So, so overall, it's consistent. It's telling us the same thing, but, but there's different levels of emphasis as time goes by. But think on there, that's 190 AD to 1961 in terms of interpretation. It is remarkably consistent. just want to look at Andreas for a moment, because Jonathan Burke, in his excellent book, that if you haven't got, I don't know whether it's on the bookshelf at the back, but uh, uh, it'll be at the Prophecy Day next week if, uh, if not. Uh, in his very good book, he says, of greatest importance is Andreas' division of the seals into a chronological sequence of historical eras and his application of the principles of each symbol to literal historical events. So he's taking the principles of the image. He's not interpreting it literally. He's taking the principles that are being brought out and interpreting it uh, with literal historical events. So that is the basis of continuous historic. And when was Andreas? 520. And, and actually, when you go earlier, you see that actually uh, Victorinus and Titilia were, were really doing the same thing. <coughs> so continuous historic has been around as far back as we can go. 190. What else is predicted? Well, we'll pop, um, we'll look at uh, the River Euphrates a little bit later, but this is John Owen, not Brother John Owen, because it's 1649. I don't think he's that old. Uh, but he says of the great river Euphrates. Now we see that as the drawing up of the Euphrates we see as, the, uh, as being fulfilled in, in uh, the, the First World War. So 1649 is, is a long way before the First World War. He says of the great river Euphrates and then it may well enough denote the Turkish power which proud as it is today possessing in peace all those regions of the east yet God can quickly make it wither and be dried up. He knew exactly what the drying up of the Euphrates meant and he was an awful long time before him. In fact, looking again through history you see a remarkable consistency of what people understood by drying up of the Euphrates. Interestingly again, look at what they interpret the kings of the east to be. Now, normally today we would look at the the preparation of the kings of the east, being preparation for the saints to come. But they see it as a return of the Jews to Israel. Now when you think about it, the saints can't come until natural Israel has been in the land. And natural Israel being in the land is then God's preparation for spiritual Israel. The, 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 the kingdom of priests and kings that uh, are the redeemed. So he's consistent, but we just have a little in different emphasis. Because what well, we can see Israel in the land, and to, to those of us who are born after the return of, of the nation of Israel to the land, almost, well, it's just there, isn't it? And we, we forget sometimes that the seismic event of the return of the nation of Israel. But to these commentators, who were so far before the return of Israel, they looked and said, do you know what? Impossible as it seems, Israel's got to come back to the land. 
Samuel Garrett, again, he's talking about the heads of the beast here. He says, the church of Rome would accommodate itself with equal ease to a Holy Roman Empire or to a United States of Europe. He's writing in 1897. Mm-hmm. Churchill's speech, which is a, seen as a sort of precursor of um, the United States of Europe, it is not till after the Second World War. Each, as far as I can see, would be a fulfilment of prophecy. So there's got to be a, a return. He says, in which of these ways, the fourth of Daniel's beasts or the Western Roman Empire, I think Revelation is to be revived, I don't think prophecy determines. But its revival in some form seems absolutely required by the prediction. So in 1897, he said there's got to be a United States of Europe. There has to be a federation. There has to be a return to to what we saw under the Holy Roman Empire. Quite how it happens, I'm not quite sure. But it's going to happen. And of course, we can see it today. Lisbon Treaty brought about that federation. (coughs) Looking at the heads of the beasts again, we see through history, going back to 1511, and remarkable consistency in interpretation as to what those first six heads were going to be. And they looked and knew what the seventh head was about. So let's move on to the structure of Revelation. I did wonder, you know, how, how, how's, how's the best way of, of representing Revelation? So uh, I've, uh, I've got 22 little bars uh, across the screen, and we're going to fill those in one by one as we unveil the structure. Now, I don't know whether it's the best way of doing things, but when I start a job, I always do the easy bits first and then work on the more difficult bits afterwards. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's just because I'm lazy or... Uh, or whether I just like the idea of getting lots done. So what we're going to do is we're going to fill in what, relatively speaking, is the the easier bits to identify. Uh, And those are the kingdom visions. So we have a kingdom vision in chapter 1, don't we? We see the representative, the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. The the, the vision that that picks up from uh, Daniel um, and the ancient days. We've also got a kingdom vision in chapter 4, a kingdom vision in chapter 5, a kingdom vision in chapter 7, a kingdom vision in chapter 10, a kingdom vision in chapter 14, a kingdom vision, well by the time we get to chapter 20 it's not actually a kingdom vision, it's the kingdom age, but it's a vision of the kingdom age. Chapter 21, life beyond the kingdom age, we've gone a long way forward now, and of course chapter 22 that chapter of no more curse the, the undoing of everything that was done uh, in the fall in the garden of Eden have you ever realised how packed full of kingdom visions revelation is but we think of it as a book of prophecy and yet there's so much of uh, kingdom visions in actual fact uh, chapter 11 about a third of it is kingdom vision uh, and chapter uh, 15 all but one verse is kingdom vision. So, if we put those in as well, we're half the book is visions of the kingdom. So, perhaps we ought to have an extra couple of uh, couple of sessions at the end, looking at the kingdom visions because they're there for us to study and they're there for exhortation and help on our way. But we'll take those two out for now. Let's start filling in the other things. Well, right at the beginning, we've got the letters to the seven ecclesias. Now, we don't normally think those as being particularly prophetic. We think of those as being very exhortational and, and helpful to us in seeing uh, how we should live our lives. But I think there is something that, it, that is directing our thoughts in those letters to the ecclesias. I've marked the, the seven ecclesias there. What is God telling us by selecting those seven ecclesias? Well, the Gospels were all about this area down here, weren't they? The Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry to Israel. The Acts, well, that goes from Jerusalem and that spreads out throughout the Roman Empire. Perhaps what the Lord Jesus wants us to recognise is that his focus is now moving. It's not a focus on the land of Israel anymore. It's a focus on what happens here 
and what happens in this area of what was the Seleucid area of Greece and what becomes the first part, the Narcessan part of the Roman Empire because it's on these coasts here that the Roman Empire spreads into the, the Greek area. Remember that the, the, the horn of the goat comes out of the Greek part. So, so we see the Roman Empire coming out of the Greek Empire. And of course we move a little bit further forward. It becomes these areas here that the seven ecclesias are written to becomes part of the Byzantine Empire, the eastern leg of the Roman Empire. And as I said when we looked at Daniel, we have to see in Daniel in Revelation an eastern and a western fulfilment of this Roman power. So I think that's where it is pointing to us. Looking at the seals, we've talked about the seals already, we're just going to look at the seals very briefly in one slide, and then we're just going to look at the, the six trumpets, which um, fill chapters 7 and 8. So the seals, well we've seen 1700 years of consistent interpretation, telling us that this is coming considering the 1st and the 4th centuries AD. And it finishes with the first great earthquake. There's three great earthquakes in Revelation, the first one is at the end of the first seals. Now I know a criticism of continuous historic is you're always having to pour through the you know the ancient history books and, and Bible study shouldn't be about being an expert in what Gibbon says or what Encyclopedia Britannica says or, or one of the other history books. But it's ancient history to us. It was signs of the times to our brethren and sisters in the 2nd, the 3rd and the 4th century. We shouldn't forget that. Revelation isn't just for us. It's for all the brethren and sisters through the ages. So if we find it hard sometimes to work out what, what uh, you know, the, the seals are on about and what happened, well, fair enough. It isn't primarily aimed at us. It's aimed at a different generation. Because then it would have given them illumination. So chapters 8 and 9 look at the, the six trumpets. Jonathan Burke, in his writing, he says, the interpretation of the six trumpets is remarkable for its consistency. Expositors rapidly developed the correct interpretation and then held it for over a thousand years. And we hear some of the new interpretations of Scripture. We have to ask ourselves, are they going to last for over a thousand years? <coughs> Alexander Keith in 1831 says there's scarcely so uniform agreement among interpreters concerning any other part of the apocalypse as respecting the fifth and the sixth trumpets or the first and the second woes to the Saracens and the Turks. So these trumpets are talking about, these woes are talking about the, the Saracens and the Turks coming into Europe and its judgments against uh, Europe. So again to us, it's ancient history. Probably not something that's even taught in schools. But again, to the brethren and sisters who lived in those eras, this would be prophecy being fulfilled. As they saw the Saracens coming in, and they saw the Turks coming in from the east. And saw, well that's exactly what Revelation is telling us. We then come to probably, well two of the three uh, chapters there are, are probably the most difficult areas of revelation we have in chapters 11 the two witnesses and we have in chapter 12 the, the man child which is on the face of it quite difficult to, to understand chapter 11 I'm just going to with chapter 11 and chapter 12 I'm just going to just pick out a few of the things that people will find most difficult and then see what commentators said about them. These are going to be dealt with in later talks and obviously then there's much more opportunity to, to go through the detail of what uh, they mean. But let's just do um, chapter 11 first of all because there are... Uh, a, a number of differences with people as to, as to what is being meant uh, by 
uh, the, the events in chapter 11. We're going to look at a moment at uh, 42 months at the end of chapter 2, sorry, verse 2. So, they, the, the holy city shall tread underfoot 42 months. We're going to look at that in a moment because that's taking us back to Daniel because 42 months and 30 days is 1260 days which we, we've seen it in Revelation. The one thing I want us to notice, because it seems about this is an altar and this is a temple, so is this true religion, the thing that we notice in verse 4, that there are two olive trees and two candlesticks. Now, when we go back to Zechariah, we have one olive tree, and two candlesticks. So this is subtly different. It's two separate olive trees and two separate candlesticks. So it's talking about two different things. And who are they standing before? Well, they're standing before whoever's in control of this, this temple. They're standing before the God of the earth. They're not standing before the true God, the God of heaven and earth, the God that dwells in heaven. This is a ruler over the earth, the kingdoms of men. The other thing we want to look at is verse 8, where it says, Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So we think to ourselves, oh, well, was Jesus crucified? Crucified in Jerusalem. So this must be talking about Jerusalem. But we would be erroneous in that, and the commentators in the past would tell us that as well. Jerusalem isn't called Sodom and Egypt. Jerusalem will be the city of our great God. And the other thing we're just going to look at uh, is the uh, is the great earthquake uh, in verse 13. The same hour there was a great earthquake, so this is the second of the great earthquakes. And the tenth part of the city fell. So that's perhaps going to help us with our understanding of where is this city that is referred to in verse 8, that great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt. Because if we could find commentators who, who could work out what the tenth part of the city was in verse 13, we would be fairly certain that we've correctly interpreted what that city in verse 8 is. So, let's have a look. Beda in 7.30, talking about Sodom and Egypt. It is no wonder then, if the city of the ungodly, which feared not to crucify the Lord, has his servants in derision, even when they are slain, and such things as these, and such things as this, ecclesiastical history relates to have often occurred. Now, I've cut these quotes down to try and fit them on the slide in a big enough font that everybody can read them. But I'm, I've got the fuller quotes if anybody wants to look at them later. But, but what he's saying is, you know, what nation or what people have had the Lord Jesus? crucified and are happy to slay his true followers and he says well ecclesiastical history tells us it's the papacy it's the the, the Roman system they have persecuted the saints so so he's identifying it as Europe, the Roman world uh, the false religion um, being Sodom and Egypt Berengal in 800, this is quoted by um, Eliot uh, Hore, uh, he, he quotes Berengal to say, if we wish by the great city to understand terrestrial Jerusalem as the place of which it is said where also the Lord of them was crucified, we shall wander from the truth. So in other words, we shouldn't identify it with Jerusalem. And if we look at the historians, from Victorianus in AD 300 to Grant Guinness in 1888, the majority of the writers 
understand Sodom and Egypt to refer to either the city or the empire of Rome or to the Roman church. Now, it isn't as universal in interpretation as, as the previous ones I gave you on the slide. There are some that think it's Jerusalem. But as time goes on, you get more and more consistency with the writers identifying it as the Roman city. Let's look now at the tenth part of the city, because I think this is remarkable that there were commentators who had correctly identified who Sodom and Egypt were, and were able to identify the tenth part of the city. This is a, a painting of the French Revolution, 1789, that we would normally associate with the, the, the tenth part of the city being um, destroyed. 1639, Thomas Goodwin says this, By the tenth part of the city, I understand, as Mr. Brightman before me, and Mr. Brightman was in 1605, some tenth part of Europe. So he's identifying Sodom and Egypt, that great city, is Europe. And so he's saying, well, so a tenth part of the great city is some part, a tenth part of Europe. Now, his next quote um, uh, it says, this, uh, this is Thomas Goodwin in 1639, um, again. Now, I've doc- I haven't doctored this quote, that's wrong to say. I have condensed this quote, um, and I've got the full quote uh, here. But I'll condense this quote again on one slide, and it's, it's lost a little bit of, of, of the language in it. But he says, The saints and churches of France, God has made a wonder unto me in all these proceedings towards them, first and last. And so, as that kingdom had the first great stroke. In other words, France was preeminent of the nations within uh, Catholic Europe. So now, it should have the honour of having the last great stroke in the ruin of Rome. In other words, he's saying, in 1639, I think, when it talks about the tenth part of Europe, or tenth part of the city, in Revelation chapter 11, I think that's referring, that's going to refer to France. How prescient. Because it was France, it was the French Revolution. Let's move on to chapter 12, The Man Child. Again, provides difficulties, it's hard to understand. But let's just pick out what is being represented by the woman clothed with the sun. Let's have a clue on the picture there. First of all, the woman is with child. If she represents the church, then the church, the true church, is always talked of as being a virgin. This is not a virgin. So we would say that this is the true church that has in some way been corrupted. If you turn to chapter 12 and verse 17... We're told there, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which kept the commandments of God. So if there's a remnant of her seed which keeps the commandments of God, the rest of her seed cannot be keeping the commandments of God. So the ecclesia started off as being the true ecclesia. And over time it became corrupted. But there was a remnant still that wasn't corrupted. She's clothed with the sun and the moon. Sun and moon represent rulership. It was the moon that dictated when the religious holidays in Israel started. So so the moon is represented with uh, religious authority. The sun, it represents power. It represents the um, power of nation. So it is the combining of rulership of people with the, the religious aspects as well. Which takes us back to Babylon, doesn't it? That we identified in chapter 3 of Daniel. Uh, and those comments on the rulership of the papacy. Now the man-child 
we would traditionally, uh, as a continuous historic uh, interpretation, see that as Constantine. The interpretation is more variable on this as you go through time. In 520, Andreas identifies it as the Christians, Victorians over the pagans in 300. So that's, that's the right time period for Constantine. And essentially, that's what Constantine did. He, he, he made the Christians victorious over the pagan uh, rule. Uh, 1190, Joachim de Foy um, identifies the dragon's first two heads as Herod and Nero. Um, but then he says, the great battle may seem to have ended in the days of Constantine. So again, he's bringing it back to that uh, event with Constantine, where Constantine brings in the, the, the state um, religion to be Christianity or corrupted Christianity rather than paganism. So, so he's still taking it back. He doesn't identify it as Constantine, but he's taking it back to that period. Thomas Goodwin, 1654, is the first person that we've got recorded who actually attributes the man-child to Constantine. So we do see a greater variation there. I would say that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because you can't quite consistently interpret one or two aspects of Revelation, you don't throw everything out and try and start again. Sometimes, we know, we know the scriptural principle is you look at everything, you find what consistently is being talked about, be it the devil or whether it be you know, the, the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you look at what it's saying in the whole and then you deal with the difficult ones and, and see how you explain those best. It's the same with Revelation. You look at that general thrust, then you worry about the ones that are, that are more difficult to, to, to pin down. Okay, chapter 13, we have the composite beasts of Daniel. So we're picking up in chapter 13 elements in verse 2 of everything we've seen in Daniel. So the beast which I saw in chapter 13, verse 2, was like a leopard, and its feet were like the feet of a bear, and its mouth was like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and authority. So it's composite. It's also got ten crowns, uh, oh, sorry, seven heads and ten horns uh, in verse 1. So, Revelation is wanting us to take our minds back to Daniel and say, well, what was that all about? What was being represented there? It's the coming together, it's the standing up of Daniel's image, the bringing together of those different aspects of those beasts. So we have, and I think the most telling thing is the seven heads and the ten horns. Now we've got a time period in there, 42 months. And we normally attribute the 42 months um, in verse 5. It was given power unto this beast. Well, given, it was the power given unto the mouth speaking great things which comes out of the beast. It was given to him power to continue 42 months. So we keep going back to this time period, that was 1260 years. Now, traditionally, we, we would say, well, that power unto the beast, being a finite time of 1260 years, ends when the Pope loses his papal land. Because at that point, he then is no longer a secular and a religious leader. But of course, we're looking back when people say, well, you're just sort of twisting what the scripture says to make it fit with history. But in actual fact, this is the, this is the breaching of the, the wall in Rome and the storming uh, of, of the, uh, the Pope's stronghold. When we look back in history, we see that this date and these events were predicted by continuous historic brethren many years before they took place. Just from Wikipedia, let's just pick up what happened around that time. 1860... With much of the region already in rebellion against papal rule, says Wikipedia, Sardinia Piedmont um, conquered the eastern two-thirds of papal states and cemented its hold on the south. So 1860, then you're having this, these papal lands, or this papal power, being pushed back. 1870, on the 20th of September, uh, Rome and what was left of the papal states were annexed 
to the Kingdom of Italy as a, an, as a result of a plebiscite the following October. So you go to Italy, you go to uh, Rome, you, you go to lots of different parts of Italy, you'll see September the 20th Street. What are they remembering? They're remembering the time when the, uh, the Italians took back the, the lands from the Papal States. Now let's go back in history. So that's, we're looking at something between 1860 and 1870 being fulfilled. Let's go back to 1556. Matthias Flacius says, well, I start my counting at 606. Now he's undecided where he ends it, so perhaps he's not quite sure whether he should be taking a day for a year, but he gives us a start date, 606. 1571, David Carus, I can't pronounce that, says, well, I I think there's two dates it could be. I either start at 1412, sorry, 412, and go to 1672, we'll go look at a quote from him in a moment, or it could be 606 to 1866. So he's saying 1866, this power should be removed. And what did we see? Somewhere, 1860 it started, 1870 it's finished. Hezekiah Holland, 606 to 1866, says he. Um, Lucius says 1260 years from 606, which gets us obviously to 1866. And William Whiston, 1706, still 150 years before this event, says it's going to end in 1866. So David uh, Christus says in 1571, if numbered from 412 AD, when Arik took Rome and overthrew its empire, then the end would be 1672. Or if it's from the time of focus in 1606, then the Pope's supremacy, when the Pope's supremacy began, then the end may be expected 1866. Isn't that remarkable that those brethren, those writers, were able to uh, predict with such accuracy what was going to happen? The other thing that we have uh, in the uh, in chapter 13 is obviously probably the most famous uh, line from uh, Revelation, and that's the number of the beast, which is 600, three score and six. Arrhenius, 185 AD, says, Then also Lateneos, for the Latins, that's how I identify it, it's going to be the Latins, has the number 666. And it is very probable, this being the name of the last kingdom. So, uh, he's saying, 185, I think the name of the beast is the Latins. And you can go through um, history, and it is almost universally consistent that it is the Latins that are being talked about. So very early on, the writers had worked out who this was talking about. It's talking about the Roman system, the Latins, those that write in Latin. And it's only very recently that actually, you know, lectures in universities, not with our lifetime, but 150 years ago, it's only 150 years ago, really, since Latin stopped being used as the teaching language for the universities, because they were part of this Babylonian system. Okay, so we can fill in those three difficult chapters, certainly 12, 11 and 12 I think are, are two very, very difficult chapters in Revelation. We put those in place. We then come to the chapter 15. Now chapter 15 talks about the last seven plagues uh, and then has uh, predominantly uh, a kingdom vision. Chapter 15 we have seven <coughs> angels pouring out the plagues and then we have the song of the redeemed. So we're told um, in uh, chapter 15 and verse 8, again it's a song of the redeemed and it says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So it's saying that you can't go into the temple of God, and this is the true temple, which the Lord Jesus is is going to establish. You you can't enter that until those seven plagues have been fulfilled. 
So it, it's giving us an indication that those have got to take place. But we don't have a lot more information beyond that. Chapter 16 is the six vials. And now we're sort of bang up to date with what's happening. The six vials, and we're in the six vial period, is talking about uh, the drying up of the Euphrates that we've already uh, looked at. The six vials we see is the judgment on Catholic Europe. The fifth vial is talking about the, the exile of the Pope, the, the destruction of the, uh, the papal system. The sixth vial we've seen at the beginning, didn't we, those um, quotations about the, the commentators who were able to see that this was the drying up of the, the Ottoman Empire, the Turk um, being uh, dried up back to his, uh, his original territory. And we see that uh, being fulfilled in, in 1914. But there is that, that spirit of the three unclean frogs, spirits like frogs. We have the, the democracy, the spirit of the French Revolution, that earthquake that uh, we, we refer to, uh, being everywhere. But that's what the frogs did. You remember in the plagues, the frogs got everywhere, in your chamber pots, in your beds, everywhere. So we see in this age, democracy being everywhere. We're in the toes, the iron mixed with clay. But what happens then? Well, all this is happening so that they might gather people at the end of verse 14 to the great day of God Almighty. But then the Lord Jesus comes, doesn't he? Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments as he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into the place called the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. So we're right on the edge of that, brethren and sisters, aren't we? But this is something that is, has been understood for many years. John, James Durham, 1657. The fifth bar overturned Rome, his seat, you've seen that, the fifth, uh, as the fifth trumpet seated him there and revealed him. The sixth overturns the Turks, Popes and the rest of the kingdom. Bringeth in the Jews and setteth the gospel at full brightness. So here we are in this sixth vial period. The next step is the seventh vial and the bringing in of the kingdom age. So in the seventh vial we have in verse 18 another great earthquake. This is the third great earthquake of Revelation. This is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to, to bring his judgments on the earth. But by this point, the Lord Jesus has come as a thief. He has taken his saints. The saints will accompany him in the, in the work that needs to be done in the seventh vine. So we're almost there, aren't we? We haven't really got time to talk about the judgment on the great hall uh, and the fall of Babylon uh, and uh, look at the marriage supper of the Lamb and the things that, that take place over, uh, 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 regarding the kingdom being established. But let's just go through it in, in brevity. Chapter 17, we've got the, the great hall, the woman that has descended from being the true church and is now a hall, a harlot. The, the, the corruption of the church is complete. She's riding on the Roman beast. It's the time of the final standing up uh, of Daniel's image and we know what happens next. And then we've got this last head. That beast is basically the same Roman power that in the days of the Apostle John is proclaimed by his seven heads. But in addition, he's got the names of blasphemy filling its body. This is the same beast that has continued through Revelation. And Brother W.H. Carter in 1961 says, These ten horns, of the last, you talk about the last head, we have already considered as representing the whole of the powers of the beast, which will support the Babylonian harlot in her holy war. 
fall of Babylon in chapter 18. It's the secular aspects of Babylon that are destroyed here. We have to remember that Babylon isn't just a religion. It is a state of rulership. And the kingdoms of man are being defeated. By the time we get to chapter 19, it talks about the marriage supper. The call to the marriage supper. The invitation to the nations to come and join me says the Lord Jesus, in the marriage supper, in the celebration of my kingdom being established. The marriage of the Lamb has already taken place. We have already been with our Lord. Now that celebration is to all the world to come and join us and him. But of course some will come, we know that from other scriptures. Others will resist. So there is the going out with the armies in verse 14 of chapter 19. The armies of heaven followed him upon their white horses, referring, I think, to to natural Israel, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And they go out and they they bring about God's judgments on those nations that will resist. So, brethren and sisters, we have got to the end of Revelation in our, our whirlwind little tour. What can we say? But it's not an academic exercise, is it? It isn't something that we can go and put our notes in our Bible and say, well, this means this, and that was the Turks, and that was the loss of papal land. We are joined, brothers and sisters, by a thread that has run from Daniel's time to our time. We have a rich history. We have the privilege of being able to understand what God has done in this world and what he will do. And I think the events that we see around us, which which fulfil in greater detail and more fully than I ever thought would take place before the Lord Jesus returns, I think are an opportunity for us as a brotherhood that we can be prepared for that one that is going to come as a thief. If we're looking in the right place, then we shall be expecting our master. If we're rightly understanding the signs of the times, we will have made sure that we as his bride are prepared. That we have been diligent in our discipleship. That we shall be waiting expectantly for his coming. When you look at what's happening in Greece, When you look at what's happening in the papacy, when you look at what's happening in Russia, that is the Lord God in his mercy saying, these things are told. The brethren and sisters in the years gone by have told us of what's going to happen. Take note. Listen to the the clarion call of of Revelation and Daniel. And take heed that we by God's grace might be ready when our Master returns to us.